Every evening, supper time, and just as I wear out, man, you know. Along it. comes Easter, Valentine's, and Santa way down south. It's sweet potato pie, sweet potato pie, sweet potato pie, all right. Lord Almighty, working's over, sweet potato pie tonight. Good day, young gentlemen. Where in God's green earth are we? The story is called Children on Their Birthdays, and it's based on the short story by Truman Capote. It's a coming-of-age story, two 13-year-old boys who are best friends, and then an exceptional little 13-year-old girl gets off the 5 o'clock bus, and they both instantly fall in love with her, and it changes their lives, and the whole town is changed by this one little girl. It's about falling in love for the first time and how friendship is tested when you or your friend or both of you fall in love with the same woman. When Miss Bobbitt comes along, we both want to be her sweetheart and um, it kind of tears us both apart. There's an innocence and a purity in it that you rarely see anymore. I first knew about the short story when I was 16. Then I got the rights in 1995. She said to me, I have this incredible short story and I want to turn it into a screenplay and I want to make a movie out of it. And then Howard and Karen Baldwin at Crusader read the script and loved it and it's really because of them and Crusader Entertainment that the film was made. When I first read it, I was, I thought to myself, this is going to make an unbelievably great movie. There are several things that are very different about this screenplay than the story that it was based on. In the short story, the kids capture Lionel Quince by creating leaflets and distributing them throughout the countryside and eventually the police capture this guy. So what we had to do was we created this whole storyline where the kids go after Lionel Quince and they capture him himself and they steal a tow truck to go do it. And that was never in the original story, but we needed something like that visually to make it cinematic. Time has come to take action, Billy Bob. Fortunately, I have formulated a plan. This movie is really about the kids. The kids are fantastic. I'm very impressed with them. I could never have done this at their age. <laughs> Madam, I am Miss Lily Jane Bobbin. Miss Bobbin from Memphis, Tennessee. Tanya Ramond came into our casting office, and Mark and I were auditioning kids. and took her into the back room, and as soon as she opened her mouth, it was clear that this was Miss Lily Jane Bobbitt. I got the script one night, I, I practiced it a little bit, and I went the next day for the interview. And it was my 13th birthday, the day that I auditioned. She was like, so elegant, and I don't know, she just, it was like magnetizing, how she looks when she's coming off the bus and everything. She's sort of like a miniature adult. I mean, she talks like an adult, and she has perfect diction. And she carries herself like an adult, and she uses long words, <laughs> and very complicated things that kids otherwise wouldn't say, but I think, that that's all just because of what's happened to her. Don't you know that gentlemen are put on the face of this earth for the protection of ladies? Jesse Plemons, who plays Preacher Star, is the first person we cast for the film. And he's wise beyond his years and very talented and natural. He's got some nerve. I reckon she's got to. A town like this, folks like us, I live in a family of three, and my dad is like a drunk, and my mom probably ran away. You ever seen a thing like this? You really don't care what God says when it looks down on you, do you? Billy Bob is, is more of the, the, safe, the safe one of the, of the two. Every time we do this, we get caught. We won't get caught this time, Billy Bob. If my mom finds out, she won't. My mom always finds out. My son is growing up. He's no longer my little boy, and it is no longer just about he and I. There are changes coming. Treat me like a baby. You act like a baby, I'll treat you like one. Now come down. I ain't never coming down, I swear it. In the beginning, she she really thinks that I'm her little boy, and I, I'm happy being the little boy. But at the end, I, I don't really want to be the little boy anymore. I want to be the man. Me and Joe worked on Varsity Blues together. It was weird. I think my mom called his mom and said that I got a movie and it was filming in Chicago. And then Joe tried out for a movie and he got it. And it filmed in Chicago, so he was like, oh, maybe I'll see him there. 
And then, but he didn't know that it was the same movie. And it turns out that Jesse and Joe are best friends. And the two of them end up playing best friends in our film, and we had no idea they even knew each other. There's a lot of kismet going on in this story because so many uh, lives have been intertwined before. Oh, well, hang on, what's that? Good Lord, you fell for me. Speedy is the man who was best friends with my husband before he died and they went to war together and I was also best friends with the two men all through growing up and then Speedy and I continue this deep friendship you know that that bond when two people have lost someone in common and our relationship touches for a while on being something possibly more than just friends. I, I think Speedy is a good guy and I really do like him but I don't think anybody's good enough for my mom. I, I'm still not getting over my dad's death, really. Hey, Billy Bob, you ever notice how Speedy's always talking about food for your mom? I know if you're getting it, you might as well just forget. It ain't never gonna happen. It's a sleepy little town, and I've been appointed the sheriff, and I've also picked up the uh, third generation of Speedy's garage. So I'm a mechanic also, so it's a great part. Chris uh, likes to dance. You know, he goes out every night dancing. You know, he's really stirring this town up. Chris and I have been friends for years. I'd always wanted to work with Chris. He is the quintessential professional. His attitude is so fabulous. Chris looks like a guy from the 40s anyway. So does, so does Cheryl. She, they look like they are born in that time. Cheryl Lee Diamond had worked with Mark before on a film that Mark wrote and produced called Homage. And that's why I called her, and even though she just had a baby, she agreed to uh, come and do it. It's wonderful to work with her again. And the fact that she is a mother now uh, brought a different perspective for her. There's a scene where I'm dancing with my son. That's right. I have the idea. My father taught me how to dance on his feet. So to have a scene in a film where the parent is dancing with a child was very special. Ma'am? How you doing, honey? Fine, thank you. Who are they? Lionel Quince is a, one of these southern gentleman characters that uh, says he knows a lot of people and says he's had a lot of experiences and kind of gets the town you know, going, sort of like a Henry Hill from uh, Music Man. I sure hope I haven't misjudged you. I assure you, sir, you have not. Tom's a kick, and he's very good as a part in the part of Quince because he's uh, he's like got that carpetbagger kind of mentality, like gotta strike fast and hit the road. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's been a terrible misunderstanding. It's Quince, put a cork in. And become Marker. All right, either me or Billy Bob. Nobody else. Mark is great to work with because he, even though he's a writer, he's not uh, married to everything on the page. And so it's fun because you don't, you aren't, I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do every day. We felt it was a really sensitive story that needed somebody who really understood characters. And Mark was a playwright, a very successful uh, director on the stage. And we felt that was the right combination. And both uh, Ginger and I had known him uh, from uh, our theater background. Now as a director, he's really finding his way. And uh, it's, it's very comfortable. It's fun. The other day, I put a kick me sign on the director and he walked around with a kick me sign for like a couple hours. The kids uh, have to be kept in line so that they don't grow up to be star actors with bad attitudes. So I try to paralyze them a little bit with the paralyzer every morning. He'll just come up and <laughs> me and Jesse were just playing around one day and he came up, paralyzer, and it kind of hurt, but it was pretty funny. I can't show you the paralyzer now. If it got out, everybody would be doing the paralyzer, and we'd have all these well-behaved people, and there'd be nothing to write about. I'm having so much fun. I'm having a real good time on the set. The crew is really cool. We go out to dinner, and we go go-karting, and we have so much fun. We call each other, we go swimming together. We have a good time and, and, and try to have as much fun as possible. It's a pleasure, and it's a blessing. I think the most difficult thing to do is to create a film product that both parents and kids can watch. And I think Crusader is really brave in that that's what they're trying to do. Crusader was actually started in a partnership between my husband Howard Baldwin, myself, and Philip Anschutz. We feel our movies can be extremely commercial, yet at the same time very family friendly. They will make films that will, uh, that will uplift. There's no swearing and, and uh, no violence and nudity and smoking 
and drinking, and I think that's good. I'm happy to be with a company where we can make pictures where I'm not embarrassed to tell anybody, go see it, whether it's my parents, my kids, or my neighbors. It is a movie for anybody who's ever fallen in love the first time. This is definitely something that everybody can watch. We got a great crew and a great bunch of actors and a great director, and it should do well. Gentlemen, it looks like we got ourselves an event. It's really kind of a, a movie that I hope it'll stick around for a while and generations will see it because it's, uh, it's, a, it's it has very good values to it. Sweet pie, sweet pie, sweet pie, all right. Lord Almighty, don't forget me, sweet pie.